A recent poll of 1,500 Ontarians indicated that a large majority of respondents believe the Ontario justice system is old-fashioned, intimidating, confusing, and broken. One justice expert who would probably agree with those adjectives is also one of Canada's most read and most respected newspaper columnists, Christy Blatchford, who's been covering many of Ontario's and Canada's most high-profile trials for nearly 40 years. Christy is best known as a hard-hitting, opinionated columnist for the National Post, but she's also the author of five nonfiction books, the latest of which is called Life Sentence. Stories from Four Decades of Court Reporting, or How I Fell Out of Love with the Canadian Justice System, Especially Judges. Christy, welcome. Thanks for joining welcome, us. Yeah. And Thank you very much for having me. Not at all. Uh, we really want to talk about what's in this book. We will get to your very distinguished career in a minute, but tell us why, after all these years, nearly 40 years of covering the justice system, have you lost faith in it? I think it's just a cumulative toll of small wounds and, and, and injuries over all those years. You know, I, one time too many, a judge was late coming back to court. One time too many, which is, of course, all the time. They don't have microphones in the courtroom, so you can't hear. You know, all these little indignities, none of which are justifiable. Uh, I think I just realized uh, it, my, you know, revelatory moment happened at the Mike Duffy trial actually, where uh, it was held in Ottawa, everyone remembers, and it was held in segments, but about, I don't know, uh, five weeks into the first setting, set of weeks, I realized I always write down when we start in court, what time it starts, uh, and I realized that only once had the judge actually been on time. All the other participants were there, and uh, the judge was staying, I knew, at the same hotel, uh, as I was in Ottawa across the street. It takes three minutes to get there. So I could make it on time, why couldn't he? And then it occurred to me that here we were, I was covering a trial of an unelected, unaccountable, uh, arrogant, entitled senator. And who was judging him but somebody else who was unaccountable, unelected, entitled, and arrogant? A judge. So that's when. I, I really knew that I had the light sort of went on. Yeah, yeah. The light you just went had on. it at that point. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. But uh, back in the uh, '70s, when you first started uh, covering trials, you were pretty much um, in love with the system, or you revered it, or you respected it. Um, so, was your reverence uh, naive, or was it just misplaced, or was it a gradual erosion, or was it as sudden as you've just depicted it? Well, I think the moment of clarity was sudden, but the erosion was certainly over yeah. a long period of time. And uh, I don't think my my reverence was misplaced. I mean, I tend to be a person who has a great deal of faith in institutions like, you know, government, the queen, the police, that kind of thing. And the scales have fallen from my eyes as they do for most of us as we get older. Um, and the justice system, I still deeply believe in. I think it's a very good system that most of the time works, works, works very well. But it has some significant problems. And the most significant is that it's so secretive and it's, you know, not opaque. and. As judges always tell juries, you know, the, the jury system is the shining jewel of our democracy, and it is, and yet there are all kinds of problems with it, chiefly that you, it's not really very welcoming to the public. I mean, that poll you quoted mm -hmm. off the top is absolutely dead on. You know, the judges and lawyers really, they suffer the public being in the courtroom. You know, you're recognized as a journalist who certainly pulls no punches in your writing, and it's a great credit to you. And at one point in this book, you actually described judges as, quote, remarkably smug. That's a very bold statement. What is it that judges have done or do, aside from being chronically late, that led you to that statement? Well, let me just tell you about a case I covered most recently. Sure. I, I, I was in court uh, for the d architect Douglas Cardinal's uh, attempt to have the Cleveland Indians, the Indians part of the name, uh, banned uh, for the Blue Jay playoff games. And everyone knew right off the top this was going to be a huge issue. I mean, it's on the eve of a playoff game. It has international attention. So. First of all, it's scheduled for 10 o'clock in the morning, and they change courtrooms two or three times, and they realize they can't possibly fit 
all the actual people who are there, let alone all the lawyers. So finally it's reassigned to one o'clock in the afternoon and even then we have to change courtrooms I think twice and finally get into the courtroom and it's finally about to start and the judge comes in and all the lawyers stand up and the press is, uh, you know, and the public uh, are standing and squished into these few seats and then you can't hear what the judge is saying because there are no microphones. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, even the lawyers in the back row couldn't hear what the judge was saying. You know, whenever I speak to judges, and I do occasionally and probably will much less often in the future because of that book, but whenever I have done so, I, I turn my back to the audience and I start mumbling. And within seconds, of course, people are saying, we can't hear you, and I turn around and like the lunatic that I am say, that's what it's like to be in your courtroom, pal. Yeah. And it is. No, How can you have a public justice system? That's not right. necessarily a smug judge. That's just a fault of the, no, not even the system. No, it it's, is a smug hey. judiciary because they've known about this problem. It's like getting TV well, cameras. It's the system. Yeah, it doesn't enough. accommodate the, yeah. the public. Well, but when the Paul Bernardo trial was going on, uh, you know, in 1996, there was ongoing discussion with members of the bench and the press to bring t television cameras into the courtroom. Not one thing has changed. Not one yeah. ordinary criminal proceeding is televised. They don't have the political will. They like not being accountable. Who wouldn't like it? The police mm -hmm. loved it when they weren't accountable, when they investigated yeah. their own. I don't blame them. Yeah. Right. Well, speaking of being accountable, you're also uh, critical of the remuneration, how much money the judges no, make. No, I'm not. I just think people should know. And I think right. if you're making so 200... So the system should be more transparent. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you're making 260000 bucks a year, it seems to me you can get your ass to court on time. Mm -hmm. right. I don't so think that's it, asking a lot. It's not about the money. It's just about how it's uh, disclosure. They work for us. Yeah. Right. And yeah. public accountability is yeah. part of the system. Absolutely. That yeah. 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 And every time you ask a question of the judiciary, it is not a threat to judicial independence. Judicial independence is a wonderful thing. It means that judges have to be well paid so they're not tempted by other things. It means that the government, the parliament, doesn't tell judges what to do and can't fire them so they have job security. And because they're, they're not elected. Right. And they're, so they're not beholden to that's any right. constituencies. So, and those are all good things. But because there was a good example recently, a rapper in Nova Scotia put on his uh, Facebook or Twitter account a criticism of a sex assault uh, sentence that was handed out. It was a pretty grotesque child sex abuse case. The rapper, whose name is classified and who's very good actually, I listened to his music, I loved it, um, but he dared to say and he gave the address uh, that people could write to the judge and let him know what you think about the sentence. The guy got, uh, I'm going to probably get it wrong now, I think he got uh, a five-year sentence for uh, repeated sex assaults on this 11-year-old girl. Uh, but he'd done pretrial custody, so he ended up getting about a year and 37 weeks. And that's not very much. I mean, mm -hmm. sexual assault against children is grossly underrated. So the rapper's entitled. The rapper pays the judge's salary. Rapper's entitled to say what he wants. He said mm -hmm. what he wanted, urged people to let the judge know. And faster than you could say, Jack, the bear, the law society of uh, Nova Scotia or Newfoundland and Labrador, whichever one it was, issued a sober statement saying that there'd been a recent threat to the independence, the judicial independence. B.S. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. One of the... <laughs> one it doesn't of, take much to wind me up on this. <laughs> one, of, one of the elements of the system that you talk about is the dynamic tension, if you will, between the media and the judges. And when I go back to my days reporting, I remember there was uh, uh, there was always tension between judges and us reporters, and I never quite understood why. We're just trying to do our job, and I think, and gathering from what I've been reading in your book, it's probably worse than it was even 40 years ago. I wonder how you feel, though, that your book and the huge criticism that you've made about the system and about judges and some judges you've named is going to help that dynamic tension, I, or do you really care at well, this point? Well, uh, God knows, uh, decades of, you know, uh, deference and uh, all of that from all of us in the press hasn't done any good, hasn't achieved any change, so let's stop doing it. Let's call a spade a spade. And I don't expect this to have any influence on judges, but I hope it will have some influence on the public, and that the public will be less deferential. I mean, you can respect the office and the office holder even without you know, tugging at your forelock, and uh, you can also be critical. And if 
the sort of collective body of uh, criticism grows, then I think even the judges will have to become a little more transparent. Mm -hmm. You uh, referred before to um, a lenient sentence, uh, and uh, is this a growing trend that you see uh, more lenient sentences that are um, not reflective of the seriousness of the crime? No, or? Uh, it, it, I, I am not a big believer in putting everyone in jail for long periods of time. I just don't think it works, and I think jail should be reserved, prison should be reserved for people who commit violent crimes, serious violent crimes. Um, but one of those serious violent crimes, which I think is chronically underrated by judges, is child sex abuse. Right. And because it is so permanent, it leaves such lasting marks on children. So judgments are not serious enough or um, well, convictions the, the are the judges, not. you know, the, the, there's a saying in law that you reserve the worst sentence for the worst offender and the worst crime. And so what it, you know, they're, they refer to one another's previous sentences and nobody seems reluctant to actually whack one of these guys in a significant way and I, I don't mean I'm not advocating cruel and unusual punishment right. for anybody I, I honestly don't believe in it but I think with child sex abuse That's there needs to be a recognition and, and the Supreme Court has actually said this in there right. I think it was uh, Justice Moldaver who wrote a pretty searing judgment saying this is the damage that every child sexual crime does. Right. You know? You, you've also, um, I just want to finish this question about um, uh, changes in the system that you've observed, and one being um, how social media has caused some erosion in the system. How has that been? Well, <clears throat> again, that's particularly, in my view, and so far I think the evidence shows it, with uh, sexual assault. And I'm not talking about sexual assault against children, but sexual, especially historic sexual assault. But also, I mean, look at the kind of parallel judicial systems that have been set up at universities where there's a quiet investigation during which the rights of the accused are essentially non-existent and professors and students are found uh, to have, they're, they're pronounced guilty without any kind of ability to defend themselves. Look at what happened when Justin Trudeau was the leader of the Liberal Party before they, he became the government or they became the government. And there were kind of mysterious, they're still mysterious somewhat, allegations made against two members of the Liberal Caucus by two female members of yeah, the NDP. Right. And again, faster than you could say, they hired, the Liberal Party hired a, a lawyer from Toronto to come in and do a quiet, confidential investigation, at the end of which uh, the two members were, you know, expelled from caucus, their careers were ruined, their, their names were ruined, all without any open public process yeah, true. Mm -hmm. you know it's shocking and yeah. it's happening everywhere let me ask you in in all these years of covering trials is there one particular trial or maybe more where you believe that the accused literally or figuratively got away with murder I mean it should not have been let go but did through gaming the system in a sense no I haven't seen that um, I've seen it come close perhaps because of the amount of evidence where a judge has kept a lot of information from a jury and the jury was effectively going into the jury room with a blindfold on. Um, but juries, because they're composed of 12 ordinary people, I have way more uh, faith in 12 ordinary people than I do in any given judge. And they somehow muddled their way to the, to the right verdict in my view. I have seen a woman who, uh, <clears throat> her name was Sarah Chow, C-A-O, um, and I remember that she was convicted of manslaughter in the death of her child. Um, and as she was leaving the courtroom, she was given a suspended sentence and walked out of the courtroom a free woman. And the judge in question all but wished her a good day and said, yeah. you know, I'm ha it filled me with rage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you think needs to be done with the justice system in this country? Nationally, provincially, do we need a massive royal commission to overhaul no, the whole thing? Not another one of those. No. That, would take, that would take 20 years. And it would be filled with judges and lawyers, frankly. You know. so, but what is the solution? Do we just kind of mumble on with uh, notwithstanding well, your first, criticism? First of all, you can modern, the microphone wasn't invented well, yesterday. Yeah. And that, it sounds like it's just a bitch of the press, but it's not. You know, we are the public's representative, and often they're members of the public in the courtroom, and they should be able to hear what's being said. It's elementary, and it's long overdue. So let's do that, first of all. I think the judge picking system in the country should change. Instead of it being dominated 
or instead of it being done by committees which are dominated by lawyers and judges, it should be done by committees, as it is in Ontario, provincially, which are dominated by lay people. Because, you know, the bar, it, we're a small country, a huge one geographically, but a small country in numbers, and the bar is small. And it's too cozy by half. So I would like to see the federal uh, justice uh, judge picking system become like Ontario's, which is very good. Um, and better advertise vacancies. You know, if you have a, a couple of spots on the bench, don't just go, well, you know, Joe would be yeah. a little nudge nudge. Yeah. Do what the Ontario yeah. Provincial Committee does. Advertise the vacancy. That has the immediate effect of diversifying it for women and minorities who, would, who are not in the inner circles, who wouldn't hear about the, the jobs. They can apply. And guess what the Ontario Committee does? It interviews the applicants. <laughs> what a novel it's idea. It's shocking. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Seven, four, no, right. So yeah. those yeah. are some changes. Sure. And, and, you know, have, uh, ah, I don't know. Christy, okay. we're going to have to have you back to talk about <laughs> these and other issues in yes. your career. I'm yeah. sorry we didn't get to it. Yeah, but, but we, we will be back with we more will. Toronto Files after this short break, and thank you.